Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. This week, Lenore Skenazy, president of Let Grow, founder of the Free Range Kids Movement. We're going to ask her, do helicopter parents create snowflake kids? Check it out. Lenore, hey, how's hey. it going? Uh, so far, so good. It's one second in. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we met, uh, well, we met a long time ago. I feel like we met a million times. We we were talking at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas last year about getting together to do something like this, and it's only taken about a year. Yeah, but, really. Uh, here we are. Thank God. And Thank I'm glad we waited because you got some cool new stuff cooking. But why don't we start by you telling us who the heck you are? <laughs> That's a kind of deep question, maybe for a shrink. I'll tell you how come you're talking to me. <laughs> and that is that when my younger son was nine years old, I let him ride the subway by himself. It was his choice. He wanted to do this. I wrote a column about it because I'm a newspaper columnist by trade, why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone here in New York City, where we live. And two days after the column appeared, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and <laughs> like Fox News and NPR, and now here, kind of across the spectrum. Let's oh, so just put it away. You've been climbing the ladder to the to sort of apex. <laughs> finally, of, of media. finally, Kibbe on Liberty. It's like, yeah. aren't they going to call? They'll never call. And then they called, and yeah. here I am. Uh, the point being that I was on all those shows because I was considered uh, somewhere between odd and awful for agreeing to take my eyes off my kid and especially here in New York City which people think of as very dangerous which it's not or I wouldn't have done it because I love safety and I've spent the last 12 years trying to figure out for myself why it is so radical to let our kids do anything that our parents let us do without a second thought a generation ago it's not that the crime rate is higher it's not pollution I don't know what it is but something has changed so much that parents can almost not remember the freedom that they had. I, I was actually talking to a, a, wow, she really babbles on, doesn't she? But I was talking to a, a professor last week and she said that she was remembering a time when she was in kindergarten and she got there late and she was so embarrassed and so shy that she didn't go into the classroom. And so she stayed out in the, uh, I don't know, the playground sort of kicking around until a teacher said, hey, there she is, and, and went and, and got her and brought her in and she said, but how could it be that I was there at school alone? That would have meant that I walked to school in kindergarten. Nobody does that. And then she couldn't even re believe her own memory <laughs> of a time in, you know, in our lifetime when kids could do things on their own, and now they can't. And that's, that fascinates and worries me. You know, when I first heard you speak years ago, I, I had no idea what a helicopter mom was or helicopter parents. Mm -hmm. Or that uh, it's always a mom, for God's sake. It's always a mom. Yeah, really. I'm, I'm just Sessa. trying to be politically correct. <laughs> yeah. Really? Um, <laughs> first time on the show. We're no, yeah, first <laughs> yeah, time. Really. It's all he cares about. And, and of course, everybody my age that you talk to probably tells a story about, uh, you know, when I was a kid, and, and I think at a fairly young age, I, I went out in the morning, and I, I played in the dirt, and I, I went places that my parents had no idea where I was, and somehow or another, every night I got home, and and no broken bones and no kidnappings and mm -hmm. nothing nothing other than the usual bad things that young boys do. Yeah, and which I bet you are proud of. Yes, <laughs> right? that's, I mean, it built this character. Well, yeah. Okay, yeah. enough said, yeah. yes. <laughs> You're not gonna comment on that, but. Uh, <laughs> right, I, yeah, I'm but on that, your but show. That, that was normal, <laughs> and and for for me to, to have first heard your story and, and and you you go on and, and one of these media outlets called you the world's worst mom. America's worst mom. Amer yeah. America's yeah. worst I mom. I got bumped up later to world, but it started yeah. out just America. Yeah, yeah. there were yeah. still some people in Mao's China. Yeah, I guess. They, they thought like, no, it's me. And it's like, no, it really is her. <laughs> right. Um, but it, so so that that became sort of a, a thing for you. You were a reporter at the time, mm -hmm. which is why why you wrote that column. But mm -hmm. but but now it's it's your like your life's mission to explain to parents that. Um, your kids are actually capable of doing some things all on their own. Yeah, um, I feel like my mission is to change the culture that parents are raised in, in a way, because I don't blame, people think, oh, you're the anti-helicopter mom, and it's like, first of all, I am part helicopter on my mom's side, I come from fine helicopter stock, but even so, my mom let me walk to school 
at the same age, five, and, and the crossing guard was 10 back then. And, and I told you this weird story. Do you know that I married my crossing guard? It's, everyone thinks really? that that's, that's what they're that's afraid of. That's why you don't <laughs> let your young children. <laughs> yeah, really. Children. No, no. Off message, Lenore. Cut, cut. No, I mean, I married him many years later. I didn't know he was my crossing guard when we got married. It wasn't like I'd been stalking him. I don't have, you know, I'm a man in uniform. It was just a sash. It doesn't turn me on that much. That much. But the point is that something has changed, and I feel bad that parents are so worried about everything their kids do and now are worried that if they're not helping their kids every step along the way, you know, watching and reading and helping and aiding and assisting and hovering and intervening, that they're a bad parent. And that's sort of what society is telling them. So I want to change society because, you know, if you're breathing in all this fear and all these admonitions to worry, 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 that's why everyone in America is doing the same thing. It's not like, oh, you're so crazy and you're so neurotic and you're a you're a nutcase. It's not that at all. It's we're all breathing in this fear culture and it's having bad effects on us and our kids. Nobody wants that. But we're like, when did we start did becoming from? afraid of everything? Because I'm trying to figure out when this happened. Yeah, I've been trying to figure that out for um, just a dozen years. Uh, I'll I'll tell you the the four reasons that I think and thought for the last decade or so, but there's a couple other reasons that I think are making us even more fearful now. Um, the first reason is that the media loves nothing more than the story of a white middle class or even better, upper middle class child kidnapped by a stranger. We love that story so much, we went to Portugal <laughs> to cover the story of Maddie McCann and then made it into a, a mini series. These are stories that are gold for the, the, the media companies. And so they show them a lot. And your brain starts filling up with all these stories. If I asked you to tell me the name of 10 kids, you know, with horrible stories, you could. My mom couldn't. Back in the day, you know, it wasn't like there was a catechism of what about Elizabeth Smart? What about J.C. Dugard? Before a parent did anything. And it's not that crime has gone up. I mean, child abductions are so rare, they, they, they can't go up or down because they're very, very um, few, thank God. But the awareness of the, 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 the danger, uh, sort of over-awareness of these extremely rare, disturbing cases has filtered in. And when you're, your mind works like Google, you know, you ask, hey, is my kid safe uh, walking outside? And up pops Elizabeth Smart, and you go, oh, no. And in real Google, if you're asking, you know, find me a cheap trick to, trip to, don't find me a cheap trick, that's off message too, find me a cheap vacation, uh, you know, the the results are relevant to me. They'll find me where I want to go at, at the cheapest price. But if I say, is my kid outside, and up comes, you know, Aton Pates and Elizabeth Smart, because they're so easy to retrieve, because they're such horrible stories, they're sort of not relevant to my actual question, but they are there, and they're in my face, and I get scared. So re reason number one, that I think parents today are more scared than our parents were, is that there's so much more media. There's not only and cable, there's the internet, there's everything that's on your phone. And fear cells and hysteria cells. And, and I'm thinking, and this this must be one of the roots or an indicator of it. Do you remember the show America's Most Wanted? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the host of the show, Pete, he lost his daughter somehow. Sorry. I don't even remember the story anymore. But but that, like, they, they, they find these rare, almost non-existent, horrific cases, and they scare the shit out of everybody. They do, and and also if you were growing up at all in at all, if you ever grew up um, in the eighties, I refuse. There, there's a song about that. Um, if you were growing up in the eighties, there were the milk carton kids. Do you remember this? Yeah. Pictures on the side of a milk carton, which said, "Have you seen me?" or "The missing." And the impression you got was that these were all kids who were kidnapped off their bikes. And in fact, most of them were runaways or taken in a custodial dispute between you know, divorced parents. But the impression you got is that no kid was ever safe outside. And that's when we started getting the stranger danger warnings, even though, you know, take any glance at any statistical chart. And of course, children are far more in danger from people they know than from strangers on the street. But we got scared of strangers. So number so, one. Well, number one is the media. Uh, number two is you live in a litigious society and you start thinking like a lawyer. You know, could this be held against me? Is this safe enough? Somebody wrote to me once that her kid came back from going down the street to a neighbor's house with a waiver for the, um, the trampoline. Yeah. And you almost don't 
the deadly trampoline. Yeah, you almost don't blame the other parents, but you do. But the point is that once you start thinking about the risk in things and only seeing risk, you never see the reward. All you see is the downside. A kid could get hurt. Uh, <laughs> strangely, I was at a school giving a talk once, and um, outside, obviously, is the playground, and on it, there's a swing set. And during the day, the kids can swing on the swing set because it's school. And in the after school, which is governed by another uh, insurance agency, <laughs> they can't. You know, it's like uh, caution tape around the very same swing set. You know, you know, 2.59, you're swinging, 3 o'clock, get off that thing, you're going to die. And so we really have lost our, our perspective on what is safe and unsafe to the point where you can look at the same thing and see it as deadly or benign. You know, it's not true. Swings are okay. Swings are okay. But in New Jersey, there was this case two months ago where a kid had, uh, it happened a couple of years ago, but finally it went through, through the court system. A kid was going down a slide, fell off, and what? Broke her arm, right? And the parents sued, and they won. They won $170,000, and the reason that they won is because the, the prosecutor argued that um, the, the slide was at a 35 degree, I mean, this is probably 35 degree angle instead of a 30 degree angle. And when you have to start thinking like that, is this safe, is this unsafe, and this is safe, you lose your mind. Yeah. Everything starts seeming unsafe. You're only seeing risk. So I feel like the litigious culture has had that kind of effect on us. That's number two. You ready for three, I, two more and possibly three more? Yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm happy to add rules to this if, if that's where we want to go. Yeah, 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 add questions. So um, the reason number three is we live in an expert culture, and experts are there to tell you, you're doing it. Absolutely right. You don't need me. Goodbye. You know, I'll be home, you know, eating uh, from the cereal box. No, experts are there to tell you that you're doing it wrong. And you can't pick up a magazine, certainly not a parenting magazine, without somebody telling you what to do to raise a music lover. I'm like, I don't know, hum, to raise a genius, put a book in the house. You know, it's just everything is so deterministic and everything is so dangerous that... Uh, Parents Magazine once had an article about the, the 10 deadliest things in your house. And you know what number one was? And you're going to guess wrong. Guess. The faucet. Oh, that's a good one. You know, it probably is because, of course, a child could drown. And what, don't forget to fry drowning, uh, the fear of two summers ago. Um, no, the scary thing in your house is the... Um, Electrical plugs? No, because those are all plugs. The pet? The pet is probably pretty dangerous, yeah, or the, the dander, or yeah, the The, the, the dad blanket. that drinks too much during <laughs> football on Sunday. There you go. Uh, all right, stop. The, the thing that they said <laughs> was, now I remembered the word, it's the laundry basket. I'm just describing my <laughs> Your upbringing, Your own house, really. yeah, there was nothing yeah. dangerous in my house. Maybe the stamp collection, oh my God, she got a paper cut, now she can't eat. Um, no, it was... It's the laundry hamper because some of them are made with this twirly wire mm -hmm. that goes down. And, of course, the wire could somehow spring out and hurt your child. And, and you know, I, you got to feel for the, for the freelance writers. And I've been one who has to find a horror story about the laundry basket. And they did. They found some ophthalmologist in New Jersey who said, oh, a kid once came in with a, you know, a scraped cornea thanks to the laundry basket. And now everyone's like, oh, my God, I have one in my house. And so you've been warned about things that are absolutely not dangerous and told, watch out. Are, are top 10 listicles really the scourge of, of civilized society? You, yeah, that's. That's Fun, the, fundamentally, because right, there it. might only be three really dangerous things and in you your gotta house, but you've got to come up with like seven, and otherwise you won't get paid. Yeah, and then you have to find some expert um, who will confirm your, your uh, you know, whatever you've found. Right? You know, the, that, that angle is, is kind of interesting to me, because I feel like um, in a lot of ways, the safer we are, the more prosperous we are, the better and more wonderful things are. There's like this, this latent authoritarian urge to to focus on things that don't matter that much. Because there's nothing else left. You don't have diphtheria, darn. And so what do people do? Like there's certain there's a certain type of person, um, not typically libertarianish, that really loves to tell other people how to do things. Yeah, but I mean, it's not even the, you know, the magazines are just there mostly to sell, right. you know, which actually is capitalist, right? So they put some fears on the cover. And then inside is reason number four that we're so afraid, which is that there's, there's no easier dollar to get from somebody than the dollar of a parent who is afraid that something terrible will happen to their child and you can take away 
that danger. And so there are things you've you've seen me speak. I mean, I go on uh, you know on the circuit. I bring along my baby knee pads, which somehow I don't know the civilization seemed to have lived without for the first million years of evolution. But we need it. I bring along these table toppers, which are. Um, disposable placemats that they say you need it if the table is dirty. You also need it if the table is clean because there might be chemicals. Ooh, there might be coffee on it in a second. Um, everything that you can scare a parent about, um, then you can sell them something. There's there's this new object called the, uh, well, the one brand that I know is called the Owlet, which is a little sock that you put on the baby's uh, ankle when it's a healthy newborn baby that you've brought home from the hospital. And it gives you a readout to your phone of their pulse, movement levels, blood oxygen, and I think temperature. And I'm like, I'll ask you, Matt, what is your blood oxygen level? <laughs> Do tell. Well, well mine, mine is a little <laughs> off because I'm a little off. But, That's true. But I have no idea. I just but know it's going like to be said, off. You know, yeah. Zero to a thousand. I mean, I don't know it either. Nobody knows their blood oxygen level, and nobody needs to know it. And the only reason that that exists is I'm sure it was invented for the neonatal intensive care unit. But it's sold to regular parents, yeah. and they've changed their website and darned if I, I should have taken a picture. I guess I can use the Wayback Machine, right? But the, the first iteration of their website that I saw said, just because your little one's chest is going up and down doesn't mean she's getting enough oxygen. And I'm like, what does it mean? <laughs> you know, I, I think that's exactly what it means. And, and the chances that their chest going up and down and their breathing it means that they are really not going to live through the night is, is going to drive a parent crazy. And that's why I feel so bad for parents. If you're being told that nothing is safe enough, including your sleeping child in a crib with no blankets and no pillows and no stuffed animals and no baby bumpers, just the, the, a plank, um, then nothing is safe enough. And that's that's why my heart goes out to parents because yeah, you're horrible. being driven you're crazy. Be, you're, you're being be driven crazy. You're going to be crazy and neurotic and sleepless right. and right. scared to death that someone's going to judge you for being a bad parent. Right. And so, so the fifth sort of reason that is um, a little hazier with me is... By the way, we need to get to 10 at this point. <laughs> Right. Can't you do a five listicle and then they have to like subscribe yeah, for the yeah, other yeah. five? Right. Just send a hundred dollars and you'll hear five more things to worry about. Um, is is the is the fact that technology allows us to be omniscient like that? I mean, you can tell from three states away, you know, what your kid's blood oxygen level is and where they're going and who they're talking to and um, what they texted and what they there was a there was something on Indiegogo where it would tell you. I don't know if this thing got um, funded or not, but it was an app that would let you. The kid took pictures of everything they ate, which is already like crazy making, and then it was a Fitbit. So you could compare, or the algorithm would compare, let's see, he had a piece of pie at lunch and he only went, he couldn't go on the swing because <laughs> that was too dangerous, so he just sat there all afternoon. So he needs to do 22 jumping jacks to get back to his optimal weight. And it's like, <sighs> that's a lot of control yeah. over another human being. Somewhere between 1984 and the Matrix. Yeah. Um, my, my paranoia is now emerging. I'm like, I see what they're doing here. You see what they're doing. And I don't even know who they is because it feels like everything and everyone, including, uh, you know, I hesitate to say that they're all nefarious, all the tech companies that say, let's just make sure that your child is safe. But it sure ends up compromising the idea of trust. Yeah. You know, if the only way you can trust your child is by seeing every text they send and checking every grade they get and seeing where they are on a map at all times, that's not actually trust. That's surveillance, mm -hmm. but it's being it's being sold to us as like, aren't you glad that you can be sure that your kid is fine and you can trust them because you know where they are? And it's like, that's not how society works. That's how sort of an, uh, an overlord works. And if you read Harry Potter, and there's no, um, there's no weird uh, conspiracy theory about Harry Potter, it's just when Harry Potter was written, the Marauder's Map, did you read Harry Potter? Yes. Oh, you did? Okay, because I didn't see the Matrix. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, so remember the Marauder's Map? I mean, Harry can see, you know, where is Draco? And uh, it was future. It was magic. And all of a sudden, that's just a normal thing for parents to have on the phone. Oh, she's here. Oh, she's here. And first of all, the second the kid's battery dies or they're left, they, they fall asleep on the bus and they're going to the wrong place, you know, you're, you're convinced that they're gone forever. Um, but secondly, you're, you're raising kids to think almost that they're not safe unless somebody is constantly watching them. And 
the way we've trained parents to be scared for their kids is dribbling into the kids now. And people keep wondering, why are kids so anxious? Why are they depressed? Anxiety is spiking. And there's these theories, you know, is it uh, technology? Is it too much social media? And I, I brought my examples of seventh graders writing what they were afraid to do. And it's the idea that parents have been told that you have to watch your kid all the time. And, and it's having, um, it's, it's like being raised with one of those ankle things, or, you know, on the work release prisoners. It's, it's not freedom. Thinking about the cast, the, the cascading effect of all this stuff, like um, if, if you don't trust your kid and they're basically wired so that you can surveil them 24-7, um, how would a young person learn about personal responsibility? Because one destroys the other, and that also cascades to an inability to, to take risks. And Risk is the word I was waiting solves. for, yes. Yeah. yeah. Like bad, bad things do happen and things get hard and, and how do you work your way through that if, if you never had to do it on things that really weren't that hard and really weren't that risky? That's, that's my point. Right, right, right. Um, so Peter Gray is one of the co-founders of Let Grow With Me. Um, he's a fantastic psychology professor at Boston College who wrote a book called Free to Learn. And his saying that I've, I totally believe is that when there's Adults and kids together, or adults watching kids, uh, the adults are the adults and the kids are the kids. It's not until the adults aren't there that the kids start becoming the adults, you know, making the decisions, calculating the risks, dealing with the fallout. I once, for some reason, was talking to Jesse Ventura, strangely enough, the, you know, the, the, the uh, wrestler turned Wrestler slash governor. Uh, governor yeah, right. Uh, not Predator, many of us. One of the, one of the damn, damn finest movies ever. Oh. Have you not seen Predator either? Oh my God, either? I'm not a guy. What can I say? I watch rom-coms, and I, Predator just doesn't sound like one of them. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but it was Julia I'm Roberts sure, in it. I'm pretty sure <laughs> right. that children today are not, are not are not allowed to watch this movie because uh, it, it, it might trigger them. Y your whole camera crew here is going, thumbs up, Predator, because yeah. they're all guys. What can yeah. I say? I haven't well, seen it. Matt here right. is sending me notes, and he's, right, right. he's, he's getting all animated. <laughs> right. He believes that all of your examples of horrible things that have happened to children are from New Jersey, is that true? Yeah, See? <laughs> right. It's just because I live in New York. That's so all that's, we hear I about, mean, right, I mean, right, right. Just don't don't live in New Jersey and everything's fine. Right, come to New York, yeah. come to New York City and raise yeah. your kids. What was my great point I was gonna make about You're talking kids about uh, and, Let Grow and yes, one of talking your about, co Peter Gray, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if the kids don't get to take a risk, then they don't learn, like if you don't climb, like the idea, the psychology behind it is that you're climbing a tree and it's a little scary, and it's really scary to go higher than you went before, but then you get this rush of endorphins and look on top of the world, literally, because you're higher up, and that allows you, that starts building you. And, and then there's the bad stuff that builds you. Oh, Jesse Ventura fell off his bike, mangled himself like two miles or whatever from his home when he was 10 years old. He says, and um, the bike was broken. And by the way, so was his foot. He later found out, and he had to like get home by. You could only use one foot to go like this with the, you know, with the with the pedal, and then the other foot would just have to wait. And then this, and so it took forever to get home. But somehow that story is very important to him, and he remembers it a zillion years later. He's been governor. He's been wrestler of the world. Um, but I think the reason he remembers it is because how do you know? who you are without a little test. I'm not saying a horrible test. I'm not saying trauma is good for kids, but a little drama, yeah. a, a little independence. And without, if you could call your mom, mom, come get me, which I would probably do if I had a phone, it's, it's a very different experience. And, and the brain, you know, you're born with a brain that learns language, for instance, just by hearing it, it comes ready for language, and your brain also comes ready for play. This drive for play is very human. It's actually across all animals. And and play means, you know, deciding what to do and having an argument and solving it and, you know, not fair and that ball was out and we have to uh, compromise and we have to come up with something to do and then you bring along your little brother and we have to figure out how to deal with him. And all these things, you know, the betrayals, the frustrations, the fear, the risk, and the joy, and the exhilaration, and the pride are all supposed to be part of who we are as a foundation for us to be successful adults. That's why the drive to play is in there, because all these difficult things, learning how to focus, play, concentration, um, are, are coming to play when you're trying to play. 
you want to play so much that you deal with all these other things along the way. And if there's an adult there intervening, choosing the teams, who's bringing the snack, no donuts, please, you don't get that foundation, and then you don't know who you are. And the reason I brought these, that's my little example that I travel with now, is because um, I asked a seventh grade class to tell me uh, for Let Grow, what were they kind of hesitant to do? Because Let Grow, which is the nonprofit that I'm the head of, um, suggests that schools do the Let Grow project, which by the way is free, so it's not like I'm selling anything. But the Let Grow project is kids go home with a homework assignment that says, your job is to do, your, your assignment is to do something on your own without your parents. And this has the double effect of telling the kids, you have to do something on your own, and the parents, they have to do something on their own, so you can't go with them. And Because we've already established that parents are the problem. Parents aren't the problem. It's a society <laughs> driving the parents crazy with fear. That's the problem. Never blaming the parents. Yeah. Part helicopter. So, so give us some of these. So I'm just going to read you. Well, here, you can see. Um, what, were you, what, was a, what was one of the let grow challenges that they were choosing to do but that they were hesitant to try? I was hesitant to try walking my dog alone because I was scared he would get loose. I was afraid to climb a tree because I was scared I was going to fall. I was hesitant, this was a long one, to go into a store, blah, blah, blah. I wasn't comfortable going to a crowded store with a bunch of strangers without my mom. So the store has been rewritten as like, you know, the Predator's Ball. It's Predator a, Central, yeah. Predator Central. I was hesitant to try baking because I didn't want to set anything on fire. I was afraid to do a wheelie. Um, and these are not, you know, these are regular kids. This is an upper middle class suburb. But it wasn't... You know, it was just regular kids. And to, I don't think people understand when I say overprotection is, is a serious problem in this country because really kids are growing up thinking that they aren't capable of doing almost anything and they are really anxious. And here's the one that I wanted to remember to read you at the end. Not this one, it's this one. Um, I was at first a little hesitant to use a sharp knife. These are 12 year olds uh, or 13. As my parents had never let me before. Also, I'd recently seen a TV show where a teenager using a knife cut off his finger. Um, then he finally does for his Let Grow project, and he did t the kids had to do 20 of them through the year. And it's after school, so it doesn't take school time. And as I said, it's free. Um, but he loved using a sharp knife. He said, like I said, I'd never used a sharp knife like my parents did so efficiently. Beautiful use of a, an adverb there. Um, so I was glad to yeah, find... Yeah, better, better English than you're going to get from over here. So at least we got that going for us. Yes, yeah, so you can read some of the others. I know that's okay. <laughs> um, but he said, I was uh, happy to use a sharp knife uh, like my parents did so efficiently. So I was glad to finally be on their level with at least one thing. And on their level is interesting because I feel yeah. like kids are growing up thinking that they can't possibly be competent and confident and take on the world. They're, they really... When I first started doing this project and kids were writing in totally different schools, I was afraid I was going to burn down my house when they're making scrambled eggs or, or, or toasting toast. I thought it was like the teacher had taught them hyperbole or, you know, try to make it dramatic, you know, even if it's just toast. But I've seen it in too many places that haven't had any communication with each other to think that it's just them joking around. I actually think they worry because they've been told that nothing is safe enough. Yeah. Is it... What is the reception? Like, you, you went into a regular classroom, and and you have to obviously get the teacher's permission. Or right. I don't, I don't always go. I mean, yeah. now it's on its own, and people just download everything from our yeah. website. Um, well, teachers have been coming to us because they hear about it, and, and you should all come to us if you're a teacher, because <laughs> um, they hear about it, and it seems like a really easy, efficient way to give the kids some new sense of who they are, and also the, the teachers are happy because it also gives the parents a, a little way to get back. One, one mom whose kid went off and got a mohawk, I want to go get my hair cut, came back looking sort of like you, and I'm like, oh no, but that was the kid's right, and then he started doing his homework. Be a pretty cool stash for a 12-year-old boy. Really cool. Yeah. 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 And the glasses and the black coat. I mean, it's amazing how much he came back looking exactly like Matt Kibbe. It was uncanny. That's because I've never grown up. <laughs> All right. I thought maybe it was Matt Kibbe. Um, anyways, the point being that it's easy. Teachers like it. Um, parents end up ecstatic. And it took me a long time to figure out why. And at first I thought it was they were so happy that the kid, you know, went out and got the bread and came back. And they were like so proud of the kid or that the kid hadn't gotten, you know, s snatched off the street. And it, 
it, it didn't make sense to me because the level of radiant joy, which I like, was, it seemed disproportionate to the minor thing mm -hmm. that the kids had done. And um, I don't know how it finally came, but I think it's that uh, we are, as, as wired as we are to worry for our kids, we are also wired to want them to blossom. And when the kid comes home and you realize like, hey, he's gonna be okay. I have a nice story about this afterwards. I think it is um, existential. I think it's parents know that they brought a child into the world and at some point they're, go they're gonna die and their child must live and they've had no evidence until then that the kid could do it without them. And I think that is a profound joy parents so it's are liberating ecstatic. for everybody it is so liberating talk about liberty it yeah. is completely liberating so here's the story so this wasn't actually um the lecro project but it was a similar story which is that I was talking to a, a columnist for the washington post back when the whole um Maytive story broke which was um, a mom who was arrested or investigated for letting her kids walk home from the park they were 10 and 6 in silver springs maryland Anyway, so... Oh, I remember now. Yeah, yeah, huge story. So the Washington Post was on it, and they were talking to me about it. And, and then the mom said, you know, just talking mom to mom, that recently her 8-year-old son uh, accidentally... He was supposed to stay at school, but the carpool person picked him up and brought him home, and the mom wasn't there, and the kid didn't have a key because he wasn't supposed to be home. And so she's at work. She starts getting a phone call from a number she doesn't know. She's on deadline. Who are these people? They're trying to get their story in the Washington Post. Forget it. She doesn't answer. She doesn't answer. She doesn't answer. Finally, she picks it up. It's her son. Oh, my God. Why, why are you calling me? You don't even have a phone. Where are you? And he said, well, I'm at the deli. It's, you know, I'm at the grocery, like, you know, three blocks from the house. I was like, I'll come get you. And she, you know, throws down her stuff, puts her purse and goes in the, you know, grabs her car and run, drives over there and, and opens the door. And there's her son at the back of the store with the nice grocer. And they're putting the meat on the shelves. And it turned out that sure enough, sure, he'd gotten home, couldn't couldn't get in the house, figured out, okay, I'll just walk, you know, the, the, the grocery's a couple blocks away. And those nice people at the grocery start calling the mom. She's not picking up. And they're like, okay, well, um, they give him a snack. <laughs> he does his homework. And they, they're like, well, you're home. You're here. Why don't you just help me out? I'm, I have to put the meat out. And it was a glorious experience for the kid who felt so proud and for the mom. And if you take all those out of the kid's life, why? Why? Isn't that what you want to give your kid? This great experience that they'll never forget when they get to see I'm that kid who figured it out. You know, that, that, that process of sort of struggling and failing and falling over on your bike, and it, it, it could be something far more monumental. Um, and the rush that you get when you figure it out and do it right, I mean, that, that to me is the essence of, of the human experience. And if you take that away, it, it, it sounds like it's a disaster. It sounds like it to me. I mean, kids thinking that they can't go into a store, they can't talk to a stranger, they can't walk their own dog. That's very disturbing to me. And, and sometimes people think, oh, Lenore, she wants independence for kids. And it's like, I want life for kids. I want a country where the kids are getting to college and they can handle everything from free speech to a mouse in the dorm. I want them going off to work. I read that one out of every two Gen Zs, and there aren't that many of them in the workplace now, but have taken time off for, for mental health issues. It's, it's not fair to leave them without, remember I was talking about the brain being wired. If the brain isn't wired to give you a little springiness, you know, to be the net, you know, you have to wire that net for yourself. And if there's, and if there's always been somebody there instead of a net, you don't have the net. Um, so Jonathan Haidt, who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, is another one of the founders of Let Grow. And um, we wrote a piece for Reason together, and it's called The Fragile Generation. And we start with my favorite anecdote of all time, which was Parents Magazine had another article, not about laundry hampers. This one was about um, how to have the perfect play date. We can talk about play dates ad nauseum later, but the point is that um, one of the questions was, your child is old enough to stay home alone and often does, but now she has a play date over, can you, can you run off to the dry cleaner? And the answer was no. Why? Because it, the supervision needs to be 24-7. Yeah, because they, 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 they spelled it out. They said, what if they have a squabble? You want to be able to intervene before anyone's feelings get too hurt. 
And so, once again, the parents have been instructed because to— Because there'll be no squabbles in real life later. Yes, yeah, yeah, really. There will always be—well, there is. Now there's HR, there's the deans. You know, there's always—if you've been told to outsource all your frustration to somebody else to figure it out, um, first of all, it's drag for the parents because they always have to be there refereeing. And then secondly, you haven't figured out how to deal with the frustration. But the, the, the frustration. But what really upsets me is Parents Magazine suggesting to parents that kids can't, can't handle a spat, that it's so monumental to be upset for a few minutes that it, will be, it constitutes a trauma from which they won't recover, yeah. so you better be there. Well, I want, that's what I wanted to ask you, and I, I think you guys have touched on some of this, but um, this type of 24-7, um, no small problem can't need cannot can go unadjudicated by <laughs> a, an authority. Yeah. Does, does that lead to what conservatives like to call the snowflake generation, like safe spaces? I think. And free speech zones and and being triggered and all that stuff. What I would say is it leads to fragility because you've raised the kids to be fragile. Uh, there's, you know, I was Googling this and I don't think it's actually true, but it's a beautiful analogy anyway, which is that supposedly if an egg is starting to hatch and you go, oh, let me help you, and you, you, know, you open the egg, the bird dies because it actually needs to develop its muscles pecking its way out. And then otherwise its neck just falls off and it's dead. Um, I think it actually turned out to be about butterflies when I started Googling. Anyways, the point being that- No, I'm triggered because I like baby birds. Yeah. So. Well, have you opened up the egg and killed a bunch? <laughs> right? <laughs> was that you? That was me. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to have nightmares tonight. Yeah, you should. You yeah. deserve it. Yeah. Um, the point being that, uh, you know, I don't like the word snowflake. I don't like making anybody feel bad. That's why I keep getting down on a culture that has told us to constantly intervene. Yeah. And of course, if that's the norm, you do expect more intervention as the years go by. And you expect to not be frustrated or upset because Parents Magazine told your mom to stop you from feeling upset the second you were having a fight with your girlfriend over who's Barbie. So like, uh, I mean, certain parts of, of media, they, did, they just love to make fun of uh, uh, safe spaces and snowflake kids. And the way, what I'm hearing you say is that certainly helicopter parents are part responsible for that, but they've also been yeah, inundated Infected. with this culture yeah. of of any right. small thing. I, I was thinking back to the the story you gave about the Washington Post story and that couple. Yeah, they weren't they explicitly practicing yeah. free, free range, range kids. Yeah, she wrote to parenting. me before it became yeah. a big story, and, yeah. and she'd written to me like a year before that about something else. I can't remember what. Yeah, it's Danielle Maytieve and her husband Sasha. And he came from the Soviet Union. <laughs> and aren't you like, you're like the founding right. mother of, of found, free yeah. range parenting? Uh, yeah, I started the free range kids blog and I have a friend who's an IP lawyer, so I got it trademarked, free range kids, but please use it. I like the phrase being out there, but let grow is the, you know, the, the next stage. It's with free range kids, you know, all I did was talk about that for 10 years, you know, hither and yon, lectures, book, everything. And, and everybody would go like this because everybody remembered their happy childhood and they were, or at least some freedom that they enjoyed. And then nothing changed. And so when we started Let Grow, the goal was to change not just minds, but behavior. And that's why we do the Let Grow Project. That's why we also do the Let Grow Play Club, where we say schools should stay open before or after school um, for free play. You know, there's a nurse there in case something goes very, very wrong. But otherwise, it's a gaggle of kids, different ages, different everything, the, the you know, special ed and the neurotypical, everybody together with a bunch of cardboard boxes and balls and jump ropes. And then at least they have, and, and no tech for those three hours. And then they have the experience of, you know, how do you make something happen? How do you deal with conflict? You know, what do you do if, if, if a kid is a total jerk, nobody wants to play with him. We just, we had a great story from a school that was doing the play club where Somehow one of the teachers recommended to this kid, I don't remember his age, somewhere between 8 and 10, who had been in the principal's office three times that week. It's like, why don't you come to play club? And so the kid came. And at first, the teachers watching, who they're not intervening, they're just watching, could see other kids like flinching when he came by. And they were worried that it might change the whole vibe of the play club. But then somebody asked him to play, and I don't know how. And then other kids started playing. And at the end... Not only was he smiling, the teachers were crying because 
it works. <laughs> Kids figure things out. And what we've done is we've taken, not only taken away their opportunities, we've taken away our belief in them. We don't even think that they can handle this. We've been told they can't handle anything, and then they don't. But when you let kids play together, they're not all bullies, or the bully is shunned, or kids learn how to deal with things. And so to, to assume the worst of kids instead of the best of kids and at least give them a chance to rise to the occasion is completely unfair. It is the opposite of liberty because it's saying you can't handle anything. Let's have the overlords. Yeah, it's just like perfect or at least perfect promise safety which mm-hmm. isn't really that safe at all because you no. don't know how to handle situations. Right, and you're at home and you're, you know, people are, there's there's diabetes. I mean, I don't know what causes all the, the diabetes and the uh, obesity and, and the depression and anxiety, but I do know that playing, running around, being with your friends, falling off your bike and, and getting yourself home um, leads to people becoming governor. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah. And kind of a big kick-ass governor, too. Yeah, really, quite yeah. big. Yes, yeah. he would have been puny had he not fallen off his bike. I think the predator took him out in the movie, but that's yeah. not, but, yeah, that's not you, real. You would know, and I yeah. wouldn't know, yeah. So we, we've mentioned Let Grow several times, mm-hmm. and, and what I'm hearing, for, I'd, li- I'd like to go back and, and sort of define it better, but it sounds sure. like you're helping the existing helicopter culture Change. unwind a little yeah. bit yeah. and without without scaring them or without making them jump into the deep end. We're going to do a couple baby steps so that, that both parents and children are are a, not only comfortable but like have that sense of accomplishment afterwards. Yeah. Tell, tell me tell me about the, it's, it's a foundation, Let Grow is it's a, a foundation. It's a non-profit. Okay. And um, our... Letgrow.com? Letgrow.com or .org. Okay. Yeah. Actually, the guy who had letgrow.com gave it to us because he believed in what we were doing, which is amazing. Really cool. Doesn't always yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, so our, our goal is to promote independence as a critical part of childhood. Without independence, we think that bad things happen. And so we're trying to make it easy, normal, and legal to give kids the independence. Easy is... Your kid has come home with an assignment. You must give them some independence. Normal is everyone in the class, everyone in the school, everyone in the school district is doing it. And we've heard from districts where they're doing the Let Grow project where a principal at one school, been there, uh, an elementary school, she'd been there 17 years, and they did the Let Grow project for one week. And the next week, when they weren't actually doing the project, she saw... Two kids on bikes, one on roller skates, which I feel like is a flashback because I don't know anybody who has roller skates anymore, and one on a skateboard. And she said in 17 years, she'd never seen any kids outside on their own. So it changes communities. And that's why we, uh, so, so you're making it easy and then you're normalizing it. You know, you're not the crazy mom letting your kids walk home from the park. Everybody's doing something like that. And then legal is that we want to make sure that giving kids some independence, whether it's by choice, you want to raise a, you know, an independent kid, or necessity, you're, work, you're a single mom, you're working two jobs, you know, your eight-year-old comes home with a latchkey, that should not be considered neglect. Neglect is something different. Neglect is disregarding their basic safety, you know, not caring and not helping and not doing anything. But certainly letting your kid walk to school, play outside, you know, I would even say let them wait in the car a few minutes. These things are not... What? Yeah, I know. You know, roll that back, cut it out, forget <laughs> it. Um, actually, I just talked to a mom today from, from Colorado who took her four kids out in a blizzard when she had to go pay for the gas, because not because she thought it was a good idea. It's not a good idea to take four little kids out in a blizzard across a slippery gas station. But she was so afraid that somebody would call 911 and say, there's a lady who let her kids wait in the car for a good, you know, two minutes and three seconds that she felt she had to do it. We don't want parents to have to second guess their decisions when they're trying to, you know, raise their kids, you know, dad's car broke down I got to go pick him up from the you know from the train I have to leave you guys at home one of you is six one of you is ten that should not be neglect neglect is something bad regular parenting making rational statistically safe decisions is normal and we can't start judging parents by this outrageously um, terrified and irrational level that we're we're holding parents to now. Let's dig into that 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 legal part because that seems in a lot of ways the most complex because you have, and I don't know, it's a chicken or egg thing where you do have <laughs> that, more and that, more citizens. Dead chicken. Yeah, well, dead geez, chick, right. bring that up. <laughs> Sorry, again. right, your trauma. But you have, um, you know, all of these um, either good Samaritans or um, mm-hmm. busybodies. <laughs> 
It's true. You don't um, know. They are. They often think that they're really helping. Yeah, they think yeah. they're helping. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I find it shocking that 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 people have so many opinions about how their how other, other people parents are raising, raising their, their, kids. their kids. It's a big. So you have you have this culture of like I'm going to call the cops on that guy. That that child's been in that car for ten seconds and the car's running and there's I've had people there talk to me who were returning the the shopping cart to the cart corral. <laughs> yeah. You know, who've come back and like I can't believe you left your kids alone. It's like yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, but, it, and 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 police do the same thing, and so. and the question is, is it, is it sort of uh, uh, legislative, regulatory, um, governments establishing more and more rules, or is it is it a culture of of everybody has to mind everybody else's business, to, or do we not even know what started first? Yeah, I don't know what started first, and it's a culture that thinks that all children are in constant danger, and if once you believe that. Then you think that any time a parent isn't with a child, they have put the child in danger and they are, you know, demonic. Who would put a child in danger? Uh, I think one of the sort of, I don't know, uh, unstated reasons that this is happening so much is that we have cell phones. You know, if you saw a kid in the car in front of the pharmacy and a mom waving, you know, you wouldn't go home and then remember, oh, I got to call the police because there was that kid. First of all, they'd be gone. Um, but now, because we've been warned that all children are in danger, and we've sort of been told that all parents are terrible, and so you should be watching out and you know hating on them as much as you can because they deserve to be ta- ta- you know taught a lesson. Between you know worry for the kids, the ease of communication, and this uh, culture that sort of encourages judgment. I mean, have you noticed we're in a kind of judgmental era yeah. at the moment? I mean, that's that's the perfect storm of just. Not only pe- people calling the police on parents, but parents having to worry about it. So Utah, you must know this, right? Yeah. Utah passed the free range parenting law back in 2018. And it says it's not neglect to let your kid play outside, you know, walk to school, whatever. And it's great. And we interviewed parents in Utah who were saying it's so nice not to have to is worry. Utah the first state Utah to, is the to first state. legalize free parenting yeah first of all that's absurd it, yes thank you but, yes. but second of all it's awesome that there's sort of this counter-revolution it is awesome and and i get there's a there's a certain libertarian rest- streak and and folks well it's it's, it's trust it's yeah. really you know i trust my kids i trust my neighbors i trust the community uh why am I not allowed to trust? Why is only distrust rewarded and trust is considered taboo? You know, you don't want that in a society. So now we have a bunch of other states that are considering laws like this, drafting them. Uh, Colorado is considering it. South Carolina, maybe Delaware. Uh, Texas, it got shelved, but hopefully the next time. Arkansas passed a, something that's not quite a law, but it's it's called a preamble that says the same thing. So I think, you know, Sometimes I get optimistic and I think all 50 states are going to do this because not because we don't want CPS to do its job. I do. If a kid is being abused or truly neglected, you know, I I, I want to save that kid, too. Nobody is pro abuse or neglect. But uh, it's gone so far that people think that they should be, you know, intervening so often. And remember, Parents Magazine said you should be home even if there's a squabble. Everybody has been taught. Call 911. You never know. There was an ad once. Such a strange ad that showed um, there was a, a person in a cafe, and then a mom rushes in with her daughter. And she says, what do you want? And the kid says, I'll have a muffin. She gets a muffin for the kid. She gets coffee for herself, and she leaves. And the, and the lady at the counter who's having her own coffee is like this. And it says, and then you see the woman who just left with her daughter reveals her shirt, and it says, child abuser. And it's like, you know, if, you're, if you think there's something a little weird, don't hesitate to call him. Like, I think the ad is weird. I think the idea that like a mom who's rushed in the morning and getting her kid a muffin is the most normal thing in the world. And to be not only inc- rewarding, but encouraging somebody to think that that was evidence of something really awful and a child is in danger is a, just what can I say? I want, I want, to, I want to end on a like, can you believe it? But I can't think of the word, but it's a, it is awful. Well, we try not to swear on this show. So we, <laughs> yeah. we, we know what you're thinking wasn't what I was thinking. I was trying to think of like, you know, just like the perfect ending of a story. And sometimes I get it. Yeah. Sometimes I don't. So I was, let's, um, let me, let me push you beyond your comfort zone. No, here, don't, don't, don't. I'll deflect. You'll, you'll be a free range mom for a minute. And, mm. But I, you, talking about all this and, and sort of the, 
the natural inclinations of, of children to experiment and learn and figure stuff out. Um, a couple of years ago, I saw a talk by a um, an academic guy, um, Sugat, Sugata Mitra. Have you heard of this guy? He's uh, born and raised in Mumbai. He's a professor in the UK, and he teaches education technology. Oh, is he the guy who put a computer in the yeah, wall? Yeah. Oh, so that's so cool. It's yeah. the hole-in-the-wall experiment yes, yes, where... Yes, I've seen him too, yeah. He, he basically put a computer in in a spot in Mumbai and let let young kids, and, and I've been to Mumbai a number of times, and, wow. and, and, and helicopter parents would freak out because yeah. um, there's kids running everywhere and doing yeah. all sorts of stuff. But the, the experiment was, can these young people figure out how stuff works all on their own? Yeah. And there's no parental supervision. Right. There's and then nothing. I think he only put, like, it could only teach you, like, uh, some kind of physics or, or advanced biology or something, and then they all figured that stuff out. Like, yeah. Yeah. But he's, his, his whole mantra, and I don't think he would use this phrase, but it's kind of like unschooling where mm -hmm. you let children, they're free enough that they can sort of pursue their interests because they're natural. Human beings are naturally curious, and and they're 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 going to figure That's this why stuff they watch out. Podcasts. Mm -hmm. And 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 that to me is 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 kind of what you're getting at. Very much so. But by the way, that the, the fact that that's true, and the fact that that we don't need huge bureaucracies and and institutions and and government reams of regulations and yeah. laws. Um, that undermines a huge industry that that sort of feeds off of this this fear and this nannyism. I just made that word up, but I feel like it's appropriate. Yeah, and and the marketplace selling us all the gadgets that yeah. will trace the kids yeah, the and tell you that by no means innocent in this. Right, right, right. No, it's it's an entire society that is really um, sort of addicted to fear. It's almost the juice yeah. that we run on. Um, because I totally believe that kids, when they're curious, figure out not only what to do, but who they are. I mean, actually, I'll, I'll do this little experiment with you. Um, uh -oh. What did you do as a kid, this is a weird one for you, um, that you still sort of see yourself doing today, like an interest? There's a guy who just wrote a book called Dark Horse about your micro interests or micro passions, whatever it is. What did you do as a kid that, like, you see, a, you know, the child is the father to the man. What do you see? So I was I was super shy and awkward, and my parents moved in the middle of high school, which was a very traumatic event for me. Mm -hmm. So I read a lot of books. Ah. And, and reading, and them. shockingly, yeah, right. yeah. a libertarian that read a lot of books and was socially awkward. I know you've, you've <laughs> never met is, that person well, before. Well, i got to meet one. <laughs> right. But that made me want to figure out how to write such things. So um, my reading when I was 13 led me to, uh, in a lot of ways, what I do today. And, and writing to me is, is that sort of adventure, like where you can, uh, you have to embarrass yourself a lot before you get to the point where you can write something that you're actually proud of. Mm -hmm. um, you don't become awesome doing anything until you actually learn how to suck at it pretty bad and then you suck less and all of a and, sudden. And you're, you're willing to keep working at it because it's so interesting to yeah. you and it's not for a trophy and it's not for a grade and it's not for a reward. It's not for someone else, it's for you. Yeah. And so whatever bureaucracy, whatever kids are doing during the rest of the day, if you would only give them some free time that's unstructured and unsupervised, I think they will find out who they are and be able to grow up independent and not not cowed by by the world or by the idea that they should be doing something that somebody else had told them to do. And I really like when I ask people the the child to the, you know, what did you do as a kid question because I've gotten great answers and one of my favorites was this lady um I was giving a talk at Cliff Bar and she said, well, what I love doing is great, but I, you know, I don't do it anymore. And I said, well, what would you do? And she said, well, we would get all the kids in the neighborhood to come to her driveway, and then they would put on a play. So she'd give everybody the role, and then they'd put on a play. And I said, what do you do now? And she said, oh, I'm head of HR. <laughs> like, let's see, you get to be, you know, the operations guy, and you get to be, so she still was doing it. Yeah. My sister was, you know, I, I once asked a, a convention of teachers, and, and that was a boring question, because they all played teacher. But there really is something that you figure out who you are, and if you're in only activities that somebody else has 
told you how to do it and that's good but try it this way and you know go home and work on it and it's not your turn you can get good at anything you can get good at chess you can get good at gymnastics but if it's you know it's quite possible that there's some weird thing that you loved I was such a weird I love doing weird things on my own you got to give kids some free time and my analogy is this and um it's not popular yet so popularize this if you look down at the world in 19 19- 70 or 80, you would see this giant swath of the rainforest, right? And then it kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And somebody said, hey, the rainforest is disappearing. And we all go, oh, my God, we need it. It's oxygen. Yikes. Uh, Stop that, you people in another place that I don't have to worry about. You just stop cutting down the rainforest. But if you looked at the world in the 70s or the 80s, at childhood free time, it was gigantic like this too. You had after school, you had Saturdays and Sundays. And it has shrunk to the size of this attractive mug. And it's just, it's oxygen for kids. And it has disappeared and it's like, that's disappearing. We need that. We think we, you know, we think we can get, you know, destroy it. Doesn't matter. It's just free time. We're giving them everything else. We're giving them organic food. We're giving them great lessons. We're giving them SAT prep. You know, it doesn't really matter. They have everything else. It's like, no, that's the oxygen. You got to save that. And so I'm saying, save it. Yeah. And there's, um, there's, you, you mentioned earlier, and, and everybody worries about this, and we, we try to figure out why um, there's so much suicide, why there's oh, so wait, much anxiety. Oh, I can't talk about suicide. It's too terrible. But yeah, you can talk about it. Well, you just the, it. the depression <laughs> that leads to that, and it's... it's, it's there's it's, a lot. You know, there's so much that goes into that. But I, can, I really feel that the anxiety that kids have, I mean, the idea that they don't just worry that they're, they're walking the dog. They worry that the dog will... Uh, that he would get loose. I mean, dogs don't often get loose or that a scary man would take me. You know, climb a tree, I was gonna break a bone. Why are they going to these these worst case scenarios? And I, my, sometimes I think it's like, you know, we want, uh, we've been told that so many safe things are unsafe, like waiting in the car for the three minutes, having the kid walk to school, play on the front lawn, that nobody can tell the difference between safe and unsafe anymore. And if something is safe 99.999 out of whatever that is, times, and it's not safe that point oh 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 one time, we start thinking, that's risk. That's too risky. It's like, you can't do anything if you've started to see extraordinarily safe circumstances as unsafe. If you're a mom and you've been told that your kid can't have an argument with her friend without this being something that you better stop or you're a bad mom and your kid is in danger, there's just no perspective left. Everything seems too dangerous. And then you start saying, well, we need more safeguards. And yeah. that's what brings me to you. So, so I have an additional theory. and Maybe I'll add it to yeah. the list if you buy it. And I, yeah. I don't know if it's a, I don't know if this works or not, but, but I'm starting to convince myself that <laughs> um, one of the problems we have in our country is that all the things that, that my grandparents worried about are, are not gone. really problems anymore. Right, right, right. We polio. Don't, we don't worry about mm-hmm. whether or not you're going to have die polio. You don't worry about whether or not there's going to be enough food on the table. Um, there's Locusts, we're, not a big worry. Yeah, not a big issue mm-hmm. anymore. Um, we're successful and prosperous and wealthy, and things are pretty good. Mm-hmm. Things are great. Mm-hmm. Um, all of these all of these. It's fears, amazing. It is amazing yeah. that we're not worrying about whether there's a, a, you know, a food supply. But those, of course, are the things that, that – humans for their entire existence have spent all their time worrying about. Right, right, right. You never, you never worried about where your kids were because you were right. worried about whether or not you were going to go kill a moose. If, right, right, right. Or the moose was going to kill you. Yeah. Right. And so you could drag it back and, and, right. and people could survive the winter. Mm-hmm. And now that all of those, those, those fundamental human concerns are sort of off the table, we worry a lot about things. And you see this in politics. There's all about, um, right. you know, what's my identity? Where's my dignity coming from, and and what's what's my purpose in life? These are these are things we obsess about. I think it's good to worry about, about your purpose in life, but yeah. go on. <laughs> but but somebody's worrying about it for me now. Is oh, yeah. what you're telling me is yeah. like somebody. You somebody's know, worrying if I'm safe. Once you've created fragile a fragile generation, that opens the door for somebody smarter than the rest of us to come in and say, "I know what your purpose is. I'm going to assign you to this," and I think that's where this comes. Like some of this um, anxiety and and lack of dignity comes from the fact that that you never got a chance to figure out what you're good at and to pursue it and to fail a little bit and succeed and then feel that adrenaline rush 
mm-hmm. of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's that's my sort of half baked. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm with you there. I think that uh, it is true that when you're not worrying about where your next meal is coming from, it's a lot easier to worry about did my did my daughter's feelings get hurt when she didn't get a trophy? Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we have other things to do. There's so many more wonderful things to do than micromanage our children's lives and be told that we're not doing it right from the left or the right or, you know, Parents Magazine. Just give yourself a break. Give your kids a break. Give them some free time. Trust them. Trust your community. If you're living in a really dangerous place, they can do things in the house. They can, you know, make dinner. They can babysit or whatever. Just remember that what you loved the most was going out and playing with your friends and making something happen and dealing with the consequences and growing up and and to not give that to your kids when you're trying to give them everything else down to the organic grape doesn't make sense and and look how great we turned out oh uh, yeah I mean, maybe right, these are right, bad right, examples right. yeah right 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 so if and, and uh, of two. <laughs> if if i'm a parent and watching this or if i'm um, an activist that wants to pass free range legislation. Give us some resources. Start oh, with, with Let's Grow. It's not Let's Grow, it's Let Grow. Okay. I didn't See. get the Let's Grow URL. So uh, that's 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 yeah. a whole different industry, I'm, I'm guessing. But uh, Yeah, I you know, there's two industries that that could be, and I don't want to talk about either of them. The point being that it's Let Grow, L-E-T-G-R-O-W dot org, or as you know, dot com, thanks to the nice guy. And on there, if you click on schools, you find the school program, the Lecro Project and the Lecro Play Club. If you click on laws, there's model legislation that you can bring to your state legislator and say, could you think about passing this? There's a proclamation if you want your town to be a Lecro town so that you just say, we want kids outside. We think it's a sign of a good uh, good group, you know, good place to live. There's a blog that has articles. There was a there was one yesterday that, that worries about CPS, but there's like, you know, how to get your kid off the couch. And here uh, today there's how to make a mug cake, which I didn't know how to do. It's really easy. Um, just things that kids could start doing on their own. And then we have a, um, a Facebook page where you can say, you know, I want my kid to play outside, but he doesn't even want to go. Anybody have an idea? Or is it crazy if I want my kid to play in the backyard? She's three. And it's sometimes it ends up snipey because everything does online but in theory and often it's a place where at least other let grow parents can talk to each other and not say like i can't believe you're thinking of letting him play outside so a lot of resources thank you so much oh thank you matt this is fun this is a long time coming yes yeah well we'll have to do it again once you've solved all of these problems yeah it should be uh let's see uh, june okay Okay. done all right thanks thank you Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.